The story of the Circanus Federation is a tale of opposing forces. Loyalty and betrayal, honor and necessity, idealism and compromise. Circanus stands as one of the most interesting of what are known as the banded kingdoms of the periphery, and it's worth digging into the where, when, and why. The planet known as Circanus is located roughly 394 light years away from Terra. On our handy map of the inner sphere in 3025, it's located in the periphery, near the shared border between the Lyran Commonwealth and the Free World's Republic. Fourth planet from its star, Circanus was very similar to Terra in size, density, and atmospheric composition. It had surface water, and the equatorial average temperature placed it firmly in the small collection of planets nearly perfect for human settlement. The fact that it wasn't settled during the Star League is likely due to its distance away from Terra. Instead, Circanus became home for local pirates, requiring a safe place to hide out from local authorities. Eventually, the planet was incorporated into the Rimworld's Republic, and by 2677, it had been forged into the Rimworld's defensive ring of planets after the construction of a military installation named Camp Amber. Following the Ameris coup and resulting civil war, Circanus became one of just many stops for the SLDF in obliterating the Rimworld's Republic. The fight for Camp Amber was brutal, with Ameris' forces making the most of the base's underground passages and labyrinthine layout. Our next piece of the Circanus puzzle is a mercenary unit known as the Black Warriors. Following a contract dispute with the Free Worlds League that nearly got the unit wiped out by pursuing house forces, the Black Warriors ended up finding refuge on Circanus. It is interesting to note that the unit has a connection to the SLDF, and many of the original band were Kerensky loyalists. Documents obtained through the Eridani Light Horse record searches suggest that many would have likely joined Kerensky on his exodus from the Inner Sphere. However, the call to action arrived six months late, after Kerensky's forces had already left. Feeling abandoned in the Inner Sphere that was falling to pieces with infighting, the Black Warriors focused on surviving. Taking contracts, which were few and far between, was not enough to sustain the unit, so they turned to banditry against the Free Worlds League settlements. While still maintaining the illusion of being a legitimate Merc unit, the Black Warriors ended up under contract with the Lyran Commonwealth with the mission to disrupt Free Worlds League border planets. The Eridani Light Horse moved to Circanus in 2853 to aid in this effort. Both units would trace their origins back to the SLDF, so it was thought that they would work together well. Unfortunately, this would not be the case, especially after the ELH leadership learned that the Black Warriors were using them as cover for pillaging the planets they were raiding. Though it may be a matter of degree, the ELH took offense to being used as cover for things like bank robberies. Eventually, the ELH turned on the Black Warriors for their breach of honor and left a significant chunk of their forces stranded on a Free Worlds League planet for the locals to handle at their leisure. The wrath of the Eridani Light Horse extended to Circanus itself as the Black Warriors were hunted down and destroyed in 2864. The settlers on Circanus, who were either descendants of Rimworlders or refugees from the Inner Sphere, bristled under the occupation of Free Worlds League forces. Many of the planet's residents had no idea the Black Warriors were operating as pirates and just saw the occupation as typical Inner Sphere imperialism. The relationship between the citizenry and the bands of mercenaries, sometimes pirates, is an interesting one. Often the piracy was ignored or hand-waved by the locals who needed the resources and supplies that the units would return with following their raids. Terms like covert operations were used to distance people from the reality that their continued existence was depending upon preying on settlements elsewhere. It created a partially complicit society where some people knew what was really going on, some people didn't know, and some people didn't care to know. In exchange for all of this support, the people of Circanus granted the pirate bands a sense of legitimacy. While dealing with outsiders, these organizations could present themselves as respectable military forces for this plucky periphery planet. The early planets of Circanus operated with all manner of subterfuge. They would conduct raids using designations, colors, declarations of intent from other units in order to create confusion concerning who was responsible for the planets being pillaged. Calling back to an earlier video where we discussed the Piranha Principle, the antics of the Circanus pirates went unaddressed and unpunished for a long time as House Merrick was busy with bigger threats during the Succession Wars. The rejuvenated Black Warriors thrived and even began to settle worlds and systems nearby Circanus. 
between the years 2990 and 3020, eight planets were added to what would be known as the Circanus Federation. In order to settle these new territories, what was described as an incentive program was created to lure people out to settle these new planets. The colonists were allowed to pay off the organizations and profiteers for transport. Unfortunately, what this resulted in was a human trafficking operation where colonists were locked into long periods of indentured servitude at their new home. All of this took place under the watch of the Federation's president, C.J. McIntyre. Now, the government on Circanus has been described as a democracy, but like so many other governments through history, the name really doesn't fit with reality. There was a president, elected every decade, and governors for the delegation of responsibilities. However, no Congress or other representative body existed. Power was concentrated in the hands of the executive, which sometimes was also the head of the Black Warriors pirate organization as well. Shockingly, it seemed to work according to the locals. Populations on Circanus and other systems under their control, like Anduron and Deidre's Den, continue to grow, both from domestic sources and a steady influx of new residents from the inner sphere who sought a less restrained form of living out in the periphery. When H.R. Little Bob McIntyre became president of the Circanus Federation in 3032, he became leader of both the civilian government and the Black Warriors. It was all very fortuitous, as a previous Black Warriors leader, Adam Syrian was killed in a tavern brawl. Power was consolidated, and McIntyre's dream of creating a periphery empire was quickly underway. Any pretense of democracy was eroded further, as McIntyre ruled with unquestioned power. Citizens could still file complaints with the local representatives and governors, but they would be ignored, as he had bigger fish to fry. Politically, McIntyre was savvy enough to enter into negotiations with both the Free Worlds League and the Lyran Commonwealth, in order to build a rapport and reconcile following many years of pirate attacks on the border planets. Somehow, through the long meetings, promises of good behavior, and return of kidnapped citizens, all while somehow avoiding taking any actual responsibility for pirate actions, McIntyre was able to secure guarantees that the houses would not spend their time or effort to invade Securdian turf. The improved relations also opened up trade, which he used to import new battle mechs and other much-needed military equipment. With the threat of invasion neutralized, President McIntyre launched a series of raids into the Illyrian Palatinate, which were a complete disaster. In 3034, the pirates of Circanus discovered that raiding and pillaging a planet in a raid was not the same as conquering it. The Illyrians were no pushovers, and when the pirates ran into heavy and assault mechs defending entrenched positions, the pirates crumbled. More than a regiment of Black Warriors light and medium mechs were obliterated. Because any dictator knows that you're only as strong as your last victory, McIntyre needed to find a way to save face. Returning defeated forces would have almost guaranteed that he end up hanging from a light pole, so instead McIntyre sent them to attack Dursadats, which was a borderline useless planet with very little in the way of resources or strategic value. It was a planet under the control of the Lothian League, and even though McIntyre expected it to be a swift and easy victory, it turned into a quagmire as the locals put up a heavy resistance to the occupation. A full battalion of Circanus forces ended up being perpetually tied down on Dursadats in order to prevent a full-scale rebellion. Now underpowered, pirate activity had to be limited, which further constrained McIntyre's resources. In 3035, another battalion of Black Warriors was wiped out by the 5th Orient Hussars during the raid on a Free Worlds League planet of Sierra. Then, adding insult to a long list of devastating injuries, McIntyre's weak leadership led to a company of mechs and their commander, Captain Hopper Morrison, to abandon the Circanus Federation to start their own mercenary unit. After this long string of embarrassments over the course of less than a decade, McIntyre had obliterated the Circanus Federation's ability to de both defend itself as well as crippling their ability to generate income through piracy. Eventually, McIntyre's leadership would be challenged. The most notable attempt was a coup organized by the son of Adam Syrian. As the rightful heir to the leadership of the Black Warriors, Michael Syrian was ready to lead by 3041. To his credit, McIntyre was prepared for the coup. He had created his own mech unit separate from the Black Warrior command structure in order to retain power. The two forces clashed on Circanus and eventually ground each other down into a stalemate. The coup ended up failing, however the result was an even weaker Circanus moving forward. 
Rebuilding was a slow process, though the Circinus Federation did take every advantage possible when the clans invaded in 3049. With the distraction pulling every eye in the inner sphere toward the clans, McIntyre was able to plan and execute a series of successful raids against Federated Commonwealth planets while at the same time behaving like the good ally in public. Once again, the duality of Circinus came into play. Black Warriors units hit the Fedcom planets repeatedly, beating up on the small mercenary units stationed there. Those good times were not to last. With the dissolution of the Federated Commonwealth, resources were finally dedicated to tracking down who was responsible for the raids on the Lyran border worlds. The not-so-cunning ruse was found out, and in 3058, every Circinus Federation world was raided by Timbuktu militia in retribution for years of harassment and pillaging. McIntyre was able to defend his capital city on Circinus from being put to the torch, but several of the other planets in the Federation were decimated. Only through the hiring of small mercenary units to defend the Federation were the strikes stopped. With relations between the Lyrans and Tatters and his own forces significantly damaged, President McIntyre sought out new alliances. He contacted the Marian Hegemony, also a state that understood the value of piracy, in hopes of finding new friends in the region. While there was some cooperation in raiding targets, the power imbalance led to suspicion and predation. It was all too easy for the Marian Hegemony to see the Circinus Federation as food rather than an ally. Communication and cooperation began to erode, and President McIntyre started to look for other allies who might be able to keep a hungry Marian Hegemony at bay. The Caesar's War In a classic case of there's always a bigger fish in the ocean, the Circinus Federation was on borrowed time. Presenting the Federation as a bulwark against Marian expansionism, President McIntyre was able to convince several intersphere powers to send military aid to Circinus. However, it would not successfully prevent aggression from the Marian hegemony. In 3066, Julius O'Reilly acted to expand the Marian hegemony into Circinus territory. Two Marian legions dropped onto planets Bantalef and Maximilian in attacks that caught the planetary defense completely off guard. Without reinforcements to send, McIntyre could only sit back and read reports as the planets were subjugated in only a few weeks. The concern only grew as word reached the president that the locals on these two planets were apparently quite eager to join the hegemony. It must have been tremendously frustrating for McIntyre to see the Marian hegemony succeeding in every way that he failed to build an empire. The second wave of the invasion included a drop onto the planet Circinus as an attempt to directly take out the leadership of the Federation. To their credit, the defense forces put up a valiant effort to repel the Marian invaders. In classic Circinian style, McIntyre used subterfuge to disguise his main force as elements of the Marian's own 4th Legio in order to hit their enemy's rear guard. While it did not ultimately prevent the Marians from completing their conquest, the additional military aid as well as savvy maneuvering from the Circinians resulted in heavy losses to the hegemony. Keeping control of Circinius was deemed too risky for the Marians, and they ended up pulling back to consolidate over the two planets they took from the Federation. In an act of pure spite, President McIntyre sent back Marian diplomatic envoys in several more pieces than they arrived. Now bloodied and content to claim victory over their two new planets, the Marian hegemony redistributed forces elsewhere in the realm without much concern for a Federation counterattack. Blakest Influence In his desperate search for allies, President McIntyre was open to peaceful gestures from almost anyone. This included the word of Blake. Some equipment salvaged from raids reflected mechs not normally seen in the periphery, and serial numbers could be traced back to Comstar storehouses and supply lines. Some have even suggested that Blakist units were included within the forces defending Circinus from the Marian hegemony during the Caesar's War. The Marians were confounded by the strength of the Circinus resistance. It was seemingly impossible, and even more likely reasons like the hiring of mercenary units was ruled out. Some of the Circinian mechs salvaged by the Marians were newer designs with upgraded weaponry way beyond the financial means of the Federation. Accusations of Blakist involvement were not confirmed or denied by the word of Blake officials at the time. By March of 3071, there was no doubt that the word of Blake was using Circinus as a base of operations. With President McIntyre dead, it was assumed that the Blakists were in control of what was left of the Federation. Attacks by Blakists into Marian hegemony territory were sourced back to Circinus. 
Word spread that the Circanist government had fallen to Blakist revolutionaries and the pirate kingdom was now firmly in their control. In April of 3081, after many years of Blakist attacks across the inner sphere which killed billions of people, Circanus was host to the last stand of Blakists against the combined force of Marian hegemony and the fleet from the Principality of Regulus. As coalition ships entered orbit, the last president of the Circanus Federation, along with the Blakist leadership on the planet, recorded their last moments. The missile clusters high above were spreading out now, scattering in the upper atmosphere. Their contrails of heat streaked past one another in all directions, forming a chaotic, ethereal web that filled the sky. In orbit above the city of Zachariah, the RPS Delos unleashed its payload along with the rest of the fleet in their designated locations. Without any warning to the populace, and ignoring the last-ditch attempts at diplomacy from the Blakists, the ships rained down their nuclear weaponry laced with cobalt as an act of absolute retribution upon the word of Blake. The creation of radioactive cobalt-60 in the thermonuclear blasts not only rendered the cities uninhabitable, but the entire planet became a wasteland of death and radioactive decay. With a half-life of 5.27 years, Cobalt-60 prevents the habitation of land near Ground Zero for a long time. Even after 50 years, there would be enough radiation to prevent continual human habitation of the area. In their act, the Coalition had killed the Word of Blake and also the Circanus Federation. It's an odd quirk of history that this little planet out in the periphery would end up being the location for such an important event in Intersphere history. They've cut us. They've bled us. They've stolen our prosperity and reduced our cities to ashes merely for the sin of demanding to live free as Regulans, rather than as slaves. Now is the time for retribution. We will bleed them as a butcher bleeds a calf and then bathe them in the fires of hell. Titus Cameron Jones, prior to the Circanus Assault, March 3081. Though it's possible that pirates will continue to operate in the area that once was the Circanus Federation, it's unlikely that Circanus itself will be the staging ground anytime soon. Terms like the Circanus and even the Black Warriors are now too tainted with the word of Blake to ever see use in the future. Such an act would surely bring undue attention and aggression. Two things the periphery pirate is loath to seek out. The legacy of the Circanus Federation is one of bold plans and unfortunate events. Some might remember it as a place where people could strike out on their own for fame and fortune, while others saw Circanus and the surrounding planets as a refuge from the deranged, unending wars of the inner sphere. It was a nation of pirates and of farmers, statesmen and bandits, zealots and disbelievers. The truth is that Circanus was all of these things, and none of them. Thank you for giving the video a go. If you want to support this in future videos, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button so you don't miss out, and that YouTube knows the video is worth sharing with new people on the platform. If you're able and wish to do so, you could purchase a channel membership for access to the MechFrog Discord channel, where all sorts of nonsense takes place. The money generated goes right back into the channel, purchasing editing tools, resources, art, anything that helps justify the roughly 12 hours it takes to create a single 15 to 20 minute Battletech lore video. Thank you to the channel members and Ko-Fi subscribers. I am eternally grateful. Until we meet again, take care and go make the world a slightly better place today and tomorrow.